Okay, so the first thing I wanna draw you guys' attention to really quick is actually something that could have happened that I think would have been better for everybody involved in watching this abysmal excuse of a fight, okay? So let's come back. I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna see if you guys notice it. Okay, he's got him up against the ropes. Oh, did you catch that? Look at the glimmer in Mike's eye. And I don't think he's actually looking at Jake. I think he's looking at Jake's ear, okay? Because we know he's got a hankering for upper ear cartilage. We know it's been a while since he's had any from Evander Holyfield. Well, who knows, but we know his criminal history. But right there, all that Mike has to do, we're talking about biomechanical breakdown, what could have happened is that he could have flexed his lower, the lower part of his cervical spine and extended the upper part of his cervical spine. A lot of people call this like a jutting motion of the neck. Also, he could have, we saw this in Robert Whitaker's video, we, we learned about the mandibular protrusion. Okay, so the, the jaw can actually come down, that tempo mandibular joint can come down and reach out. And all he had to do was flex his lower cervical spine, upper cervical spine, kind of jet that neck out, and then just barely reach out that mandibular, tempo mandibular joint, give him a little bite right there, look how close he is. You know he wants to do it. That is the face of a man who has a hankering for ear cartilage, okay? And I think it would have been better. I think it would have been better for ratings and entertainment because the fight certainly wasn't entertaining. Uh, but that's a little bit of a biomechanical example of what could have happened. We'll let you watch it all the way through since you guys have told me you wanna watch it all the way through now. Very good. All right, all right, enough funny business. Let's actually break down a couple of movements here. This isn't gonna be as in depth. We're gonna look at one one strike from Mike and one couple of punches from Jake. Uh, just this fight really wasn't much to talk about, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. So Mike, really the only glimmer, let's watch it all the way through. This is a nice left that lands on Jake and really wasn't super powerful, but you know, Jake Paul stumbled back and I think that tells you all you really need to know about him. But so he, he takes the, the straight left, he steps forward with his right, and you can see that even though he doesn't really get a really good hip shoulder separation like we talk about in, in a lot of the other striking, or a lot of the folks that are really good at striking that we see in the past, uh, he does get that really good thoracic rotation and follow through. So you can see Mike's hips is facing are facing Jake, uh, and then sort of that plane of the shoulder with that shoulder protraction that he's getting on the left arm with a really good follow through, uh, you get a little bit of that separation there. So Mike still has good awareness of his hips and shoulders. Uh, he just really can't move them as quickly or as much through, a, through a, as long of a range of motion as he could before. Uh, old Mike would have landed this, stepped forward with his left, and then hit him with an absolutely crazy right hook. Uh, and you can see Jake would not have been defending that. Uh, but he's not as quick and he's not as sharp as he was in the past. Uh, but I still think that that shows us a little bit of a glimmer of the, the boxer that Mike used to be. You could even see him kind of like bobbing and stepping and kind of surprising with that, with that left um, as he used to do in the past. All right, so I've done my best here to try and do Jake Paul a favor, although it was pretty hard. Uh, the highlights are still not um, super impressive. Uh, I'll just say that. And there's, you know, I, I've told you this before, there's no really right or wrong. Uh, this, if the outcomes are good, like we saw that with Drikus, you know, Drikus Duplessis, he's got a really weird form and he's really goofy style, um, but he knocks people out and he finishes folks. So this is, not what happened with Jake Paul and Mike Tyson. So it was kind of a hard fight to watch overall, like I said before. So let's play it all the way through, and then we'll try to find some uh, redeeming qualities, if there are any. So let's come all the way back. Whenever he, so I'm guess, I guess I'll give him this. He closes distance pretty well, right? So he, he throws that first jab, Mike drops his guard, and a really good boxer would have switched their hips immediately, driven off the ground, seemingly, like this is what we see in most boxers, right? It's not to say people don't have to do that, but would have driven off the ground, his hips would have switched away, and then his shoulders would have, the line of his shoulders would have separated from his hips. Uh, and he would have made contact with the right part of the glove. Seems like he's just trying to uh, open palm slap my mic on the top of the head. I don't know. So he's he's in, not only that, he's in midair when he makes strike, when he, when he makes contact. Okay, so the really good strikers plant their leg or shift their way over to the front, 
switch their hips to the side, their shoulders lag behind, and then that whipping motion, they take advantage of that stretch reflex. But you can see that most of the movement happens around the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint. It goes from relative horizontal, uh, horizontal abduction to adduction. Then where I really think he could have capitalized here and didn't was using switching his hips immediately once he made contact here. You'll see folks like Taporia and Holloway and Ryan Garcia, they shift their hips immediately when they plant that front leg. And so his hips would have already been facing Mike at this point and his shoulders would have been lagging behind. Uh, at least this right one would have. Now he wound up for this, but his hips, watch his hips and his shoulders here and here, they stay relatively on the same plane. And again, he's moving about his shoulder. So it, again, almost like an open palm <laughs> strike. It landed pretty well. And then here is almost like, I don't know really what he's doing, um, but he's kind of like, when he made contact, he does this like little bunny hop. Um, and this is, this is not good for trying to generate force from the ground through the hips. And he also rotates as he's doing it. Uh, I'm not sure what that's about either. But so his, his shoulders and his hips don't separate. Again, it's almost like he's just kind of moving in a really stiff way. Um, but his shoulders, now he actually does get a little bit there. And his arms kind of coming around for this uh, overhand, um, I guess. Typically when, we, when I broke down the overhead in the past, you'll see like people who are really good at the overhand flex their trunk. They step off the center line, they flex their trunk, uh, and their head is often kind of down to the side to get advantage of that stretch reflex with that whipping motion. Uh, but Jake's head stays in the same place. He's kind of in the mid hop when he does it and he lands and, you know, doesn't knock out a 58 year old man in the boxing ring with him. So take that what you will, we'll play it all the way through. Uh, and I slept through this, I was kind of upset about it. Um, but then I woke up and I wasn't so much. So take that what you will. That's Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson.